Hello, welcome to Silver Bullet. My name's Lewis Hobber. My name's Michael Hing. And if you've never joined us before, where have you been? No, it's only the first few episodes. It's absolutely fair <laughs> enough. Uh, welcome. This is a podcast where each week we get a friend, a celebrity, someone who we admire or despise to come on and tell us something that they have tried that they thought would fix their life. Then Hing and I try it as well. And at the end, we all review it. And fingers crossed... It is the quick fix to make us all perfect. That's right, you're listening to Silver Bullet. This week we are joined by one of our oldest and dearest friends. It's Veronica Milsom. G'day, Ron. Oh, hey, yeah, happy to be here. Um, I think I have the same problem that you guys have, which is crippling anxiety, correct? Of course, oh, wow. Assumptions. <laughs> Uh, in fact, when Lewis, when Lewis called me and was like, hey, do you want to be on um, our podcast uh, where we're talking about mental health problems? I was like, oh, do I? Oh, yeah, I guess the anxiety. <laughs> um, yeah, in fact, I, I did something about 15 years ago that solved nearly all of my problems. What? It's crazy because I, I obviously um, I have known you longer than almost anyone else mm. in my life. Like I've seen the anxiety happen, <laughs> but I don't think it's like, as constant as it used to be. Mm. And I never knew how you did it. I um, About 15 years ago, I just started dating this guy who has now become my husband. Gross. Ooh la la. <laughs> and one time we were walking down Ackland Street in St Kilda, right? Mm-hmm. And so I'd walked down there many times before and I'd always seen this sign um, for a psychic. And I thought, should I go in? And then I thought, ah, $65. It was a lot of money back then in the olden days, 15 years ago. And I thought, yeah, you know, I'm going to try it. Mostly, I think, because I had anxieties about my future, the future of my career, also about whether we were going to work out. And I needed answers on that. You and Uh Nick? You were looking at me when you said that. We worked out fine. No, no. (laughs) You're the only person in the room apart from Hing. (laughs) It was me and Nick, whether we would work out. Turns out, also fine. Um, But so I went into this uh, psychic. So it's like a room where it's scented with like sandalwood incense and there's velvet, crushed velvet covering all of the furniture. I don't know what, she probably doubles as like an accountant and then she's like, quickly, there's someone coming in, throws the crushed velvet over. And then she was like, oh, do you want a tarot card reading? And I was like, are you kidding? That's like woo-woo witchcraft. I'm here for a straight up psychic reading. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm here for the scientific yeah, crystal version. ball. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so she basically sat me down and told me everything that I wanted to hear. Really? It was like the opposite of a therapy session. She wasn't like, what do you think? She was like, here's what I think. Mm. And it's all the things you want to hear. Yeah. Uh, essentially that I would live a long life. She looked at my palms, you know. Mm-hmm. I, it's, I'm sure it was made that up, but it made me feel good. For those <laughs> oh, my God, enormous <laughs> hands. And she told me that I... She's like, oh, my goodness, it's a damn novel on this. <laughs> this woman's going to live forever. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she said that I was about to have a huge moment in my career and that yeah. it was going to really lead to something special for me. And she said that I was going to get married and have kids, which is what I wanted to hear too. Oh. Um, and so who, like, who could say whether that special moment was, like one of the things that happened was that I got on Sean McCullough's Mad as Hell. Or right. In, Ben Elton's Live from Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Two equally successful productions. <laughs> um, and, yeah, but it, it all kind of worked out and it made me feel good. And I walked away being like, yes. So to be clear, when you say this solved all your problems, mm-hmm. it's not that, like, she did some witchcraft on you mm. and and could accurately depict everything in your life, mm. but it was more that, like, just having something to hold on to and work towards reassured you in the anxiety you were feeling of your future. Yes, exactly. It was kind of like, I guess, what people get from horoscopes. Are you? Mm. In, I feel like you talk a talk about horoscopes, Lewis. No, I did when I was single because <laughs> I needed to meet people. <laughs> but um, then I got a girlfriend and I was like, this is all bullshit and you're all idiots. <laughs> <laughs> but did you meet her on account of it? No, God, no. Okay. No, 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 no. Um, but when you're single, if you're a single straight man, yeah. you have to... And you just want to be able to get through, like, the step one of dating apps. Yeah, yeah. You have to be able to talk, like, with re- – not, like, with great detail, but it just saves time if you can go, I'm a Gemini, I was born around this time. It just gives a certain amount of people, like – That's horrible. Yeah, it's yeah. a nightmare. It's actually yeah. a nightmare. Mm-hmm. I've and also to do it. No. No. Uh, but also um, Gemini is the one that is, like – 
that one everyone hates. Yeah, the crazy one. So oh. it, it kind of mm. gave me a bit of a bad boy image, I think, okay. out there on the dating apps. <laughs> then you disappointed people yeah. when they met you yeah. in real it's life. very polite. Well, Ron, obviously when we heard that you'd been to a psyche and that was your silver bullet, Lewis and I had to go and try it. Mm. So we did that this week. And I'll tell you what, mine was quite a doozy of an experience. <gasps> I should say I... Um, I'm very sceptical of psychics, and I was raised in a religious family, and so all of that stuff, psychics, tarot, clairvoyance, it's always been very off limits to me because even though I've undone some of the programming from my upbringing, this is one thing that I've never felt the need to overcome because I'm always like, ah, it's bullshit anyway, who cares, right? Mm. But also, they're witches, and what if they get exactly. in Exactly. You know, that's, that's so I'm, I'm like, I'm like it's, it's safe to stay away. But when I heard that it had affected your life so well, I thought I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. So I found one that was in a very touristy area of Sydney. I went to the Rocks. Oh to go wow! To a site. I mean, that might be a fancy one, is it? That's a bit of a um, well, fancy I don't know. Area. I'll tell you what. It was seventy bucks for half an hour. Ooh, so okay. you know, as, as the cost of lettuce skyrockets, <laughs> the cost of psychics <laughs> yeah. has maintained itself over a decade. Jeez, isn't that interesting? Okay. <laughs> I arrived, and they were like, "Oh, she's running late," mm-hmm. and I thought. That was a red flag because mm. I think if you're a psychic yeah. and your whole thing is being able to read the future, yeah. you know, keep to a schedule. Can surely. she predict the traffic? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I waited in a room similar to the one you described, jangly stuff, crushed velvet. <laughs> there were at least three cats. Um, oh, wow. There was a man. There was a man who I think ran the store just perched on a chair quite strangely and his... Um, and his business partner was sort of pottering around. Neither of them were the actual psychic. I waited 15 minutes in there and got quite frustrated. Did you think one of them was the psychics? Like, were you th- th- no, they going, they, oh, they're already reading me? Or they, I did become quite skeptical of that. Yeah. Mm. I thought. Like that they're looking at things that you'll do. And they're going to text then, the psychic yeah, and then like, that's yeah. what I thought. Yeah. And so I purposefully sat very still, <laughs> right, and didn't give off anything. <laughs> Right, and then I went on my phone, and I was like, "What if they've got cameras above my shoulder and can see what I'm googling on my phone?" Oh. So I googled some really specific things hmm. to see if she'd bring them up in the reading. So I googled, I googled stuff about fertility and children because I think uh-huh. that's something people talk about. I googled something about um, the stock market oh. um, to see whether or not it was going to go up or down. Uh-huh. Just a few <laughs> things like that, just to see if if she. Wow. Now it turned out I was being paranoid, and these were not things she brought up in, <laughs> <laughs> in the reading. And those re- weird old people perching were yeah. literally just doing that. They were just yeah. strange people. That yeah. is so much work. Like your the thing you're imagining. Yes, hidden cameras. This person Otherwise, is charging seventy dollars a half an yeah, hour. But then, they're going to be, be losing for, money just this, on the scouts. But the thing is, the the, 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 the system <laughs> might have been running for thirty years. You know, it might be a well-oiled machine they've yeah. got going. I don't know. Yeah. You don't know how grifters work. Exactly. <laughs> I, I finally get called upstairs into the psychic's chamber, and because um, <laughs> it's a chamber, of yeah. Course, yeah, yeah. It's behind this big curtain, and I'm like, "Do I close the curtain?" She goes, "No, no, no. Leave it open. You're safe here." <laughs> And uh, she had vaguely a, I would say, a European accent of some description. I, d- I couldn't quite place it. I sat down and she was like, I can tell immediately you are frustrated with your life. Oh. And I think that was a misreading of the situation because I was frustrated that she'd made me wait for 15 minutes. Mm. And that was the energy that was coming off me. So she obviously <laughs> got the right energy, but did like, completely misread the cause of the energy. Yeah. <laughs> I was like... This person is incredibly perceptive at reading my micro cues or emotional state or whatever. And then um, she said, what do you want to know? And I said, I'm starting a podcast with some friends. Mm. How will the podcast go? That was obviously the first thing in my, in my mind. Yeah, sure. And she yeah, said, don't to ask me, anything about kids in the future, <laughs> any of that nonsense. Well, Go well, straight for the big one, exactly. the pod. <laughs> exactly. So she said to me, well, I can tell you're very unfulfilled in your current life. Oh, and I was like, wow, that's a bit of a slam on Lewis Hope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she goes, your current work is not making you happy. This change will be good for you. And oh. I was like, she's doing all of this off the fact that I'm frustrated, which she's misread as being about my life, when in reality it's very specifically about the fact that she made me wait. Mm. But obviously I'm also conflict avoidant, so I refuse to like – I didn't actually say to her, I'm angry because I had to wait 15 minutes. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. But I guess it's a fair bet for her that people are probably coming to her in a frustrated state. You know, that would be 99% of the clientele that come to her. That's True. the reason that they do. 
So she said that this podcast is going to be huge. Really? She said it's going to be huge. She said we're going to employ a lot of people. Oh, that she goes, feels unlikely. She goes, the, the, she goes, this show you're working on, it's going to be big. Wow. It's going to involve a lot of people. You're going to have to work very hard, but it's going to be the best thing you ever do. And I was like, wow. oh, my goodness. She's oh. never listened to a podcast yeah. before, has <laughs> no, she? She doesn't no. know how they work. You're like, it's ideally not very hard work and no one <laughs> works on it at all. She, and she, <laughs> as she was doing this, she was flipping out cards and I kept asking her, what does that card mean? And then she wouldn't tell me. Oh. She, so oh. I I think I think the cards maybe we might have just been a prop. I don't know, but I was well, like, what does that one mean? It was a bad one. Well, well, that's what I. There was one that had a, a sword of, like a sword with a big heart on it, and I was like, what does that one mean? Hmm. And she was like, and then she just started talking about something else. Like she never actually told me oh. any specific cards, and she kept pivoting. And I was like, I don't think you know what you're doing. Is there a chance that the actual psychic was sick? And she just called up like a friend. Oh my gosh, she was a fill-in, a substitute psychic. <laughs> yeah. Substitute psychic. Substitute psychic. <laughs> Didn't that work? I guess wrote her name on the board. <laughs> <laughs> All right, kids, I'm wheeling in a TV. <laughs> and so then she asked me about my love life. Oh, sure. And this is where it took a really weird turn. Because I said, oh, um, I've been with the same person for eight years, or maybe nine years. And, and then she stopped me and was like, no, you're bored. And I was like, oh, no, I don't think that's what's happening. And I was like, oh, no, we, we got engaged. We're going married. She's like, it's boring. You're very bored. You're unfulfilled. You're frustrated. She's trying to break you up. Well, yeah. I don't know. And does it, is it nearly <laughs> going to work? Like, did you go, hang on, actually, yeah, I am bored. No, I was like, oh. what the fuck? You're crazy. What are you talking about? <laughs> I love my girlfriend so much, you dumb idiot. What and also, about? like, if uh, anyone ever has the, the, the chance to meet Michael's fiance hum, yeah. the last word you would ever use to describe her is boring. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> She's an ongoing tornado of chaos that <laughs> makes my life a, 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 a sometimes, sure, quite difficult. But most of the time... Time. Very interesting. I would say she's definitely not boring. But Ron, I think you're right. I think people must come to psychics often with um, a, a kind of variety of pretty um, predictable problems. And they just kind of like go through their list of stuff, or this person at least, just went through a list of stuff just to see if I latched onto anything. But I feel like for me, it was a pretty unappealing experience. Yeah, it made you wow. more anxious, if anything. So yeah, I'm absolutely. So sorry. And and quite combative with this old woman, if I'm honest. <laughs> yeah, that you wouldn't ordinarily have been like in any other day. Oh, gosh. I feel like she had too much negative energy. Yeah. Yeah. She was in the wrong job. But also, like, you do walk around with a lot of anxious energy. You know what I mean? Like, she, who knows? If she's a very empathetic, mm. spiritual hmm. person, you know, if she really does live off the vibes of other people. A Michael Hing vibe. But she did. Maybe she's never experienced someone like you before. Hey, potentially. I am a beautiful snowflake <laughs> and she, she was able to experience me for the first time. But I, there was only one specific prediction she made. Oh. One specific one that I'll be able to fact check. Ooh. Right? When I mentioned to her that Harm and I were getting married, she pointed at a card. I can't even remember what was on it. Was like a, it was like a, an axe or something. And she goes, she pointed this card and she goes, your wedding will be a cold day. Like that. <laughs> And I was like, what? And she was like, very cold. Very, very cold. So um, the, the, uh, we're getting married in August, mm. so it's winter. Okay. I mean, obviously, you know, she, yeah. she's done, she's done, she knows her seasons. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that could be something I can actually fact check because that was the only very specific prediction she gave. But that uh, cold does suggest death, doesn't it? Doesn't yeah. it? The way she said it was pretty ominous. So I'm, huh. Yeah. Uh, maybe she's huh. quite frustrated. Uh, uh, but, Lewis, how was your psychic experience? Well, so, obviously, uh, I, I knew that you were going to what I would call your traditional psychic. Sure. Mm. So I thought I'd try something with a little uh, bit of a different flavour. Mm. I went to a guy who does Turkish coffee readings. Interesting. Oh, what yeah. is a Turkish coffee? Well, what's a Turkish coffee? You don't want to know about the psychic, you just want to know about <laughs> the, the beverage itself. Sorry, I'm, it's, I'm uh, thirsty. <laughs> What can I say? You schmucks didn't offer me a drink. <laughs> um, uh, it's just, you never had a Turkish coffee? It's like regular coffee, but with it's thicker. It's very thick. Oh, delicious. Very, yeah, hmm. uh, kind of. Oh. It's actually not that delicious, but I don't want to get into it. It's nice after a big meal. I quite like it as a digestive. It's quite oh. muddy. It's Isn't like drinking coffee mud. Missing out. Okay. Um, and yeah. so, they, they, what, there was leaves in it or something? So there's coffee grounds. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> <laughs> it's not well, logistics tea. of that. So he's a psychic as well. He reads faces. Um, so he go, you go in. He goes. Let me look at your face. Did he make an assessment based on your face? So it was all. It's all together. He says he oh. pulls from everything all at once. Yeah. There's a bit of faces, a bit of coffee. So we sat down. I went to his apartment. So I went to his apartment in um, 
in Again, King's Cross. Very amateur vibe. Very amateur vibe. Yeah, but I, I kind of, I enjoyed that because I think I was like, you know what? Yeah, I want my psychic just to be someone who is, I think with your people, they're like, I'm at my job. You know what I mean? Right. I'm here at work. Mm. Come in and I'll toss you a reading. Right. Whereas with my guy, I was like, no, this is your whole way of life. Oh. Like, I'm here. I'm at your apartment. You're a psychic 24-7. In the classic sense of the word, he was an amateur doing it for the love of the psychic. Kind of. That's yeah, what I was. Okay. I was like, oh, you were forced into this. It was your calling. This isn't you doing a grift. Yeah. Oh. This is you. Okay. You were, and he told me all of the stories about how when he was young, like six and seven, he started to have these, like, feelings and he told his dad not to get involved in this business deal and his dad did it anyway and he lost all their money <gasps> and I was like man and obviously you know you can't fact check this but I love this guy sure. the other thing about my guy Dennis um first of all he, it's Turkish so it's D-E-N-I-Z so I was like Denise and he's like uh it's Dennis <laughs> I was like, okay great but uh, I got in there and he looked incredible like he just he had a great voice. He had a. He looked like a psychic. Kinda. How old do you think this guy was? Well, here's the thing. I would have guessed thirty-two. Okay. He said fifty. Whoa! So, so he had a good face. That's it. And straight away, you're like, there's something mystical about people who Botox, don't age. <laughs> I mean, it's not out of the question. Huh. But it didn't. He didn't look like he didn't look too smooth in the weird right. way. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, when you say he looked like a classic psychic, what do you mean? Well, I guess I just I would mean... have said classic psychic would be old and haggard and uh, I've been alive for four hundred years. Yeah. You know? We're thinking witch, though. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean that is my brain. Yeah. <laughs> I think this was a guy who there he had a very ethereal presence, uh -huh. mm, floaty, um, floaty uh. and also. Ageless. Huh. Okay. Floaty and ageless. Yeah. Okay. So I was pretty into this. Yeah. He made us a coffee and uh, we sat down and I was, in my mind I imagined, I was like, if this is a scam, if I was running the scam of a psychic, I would keep it vague. That's what you do, right? You'd be like, oh, you're going to be happy. Like a horoscope, yeah. 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 And so straight out, like, I'm going to play you some audio from, from Dennis. This was the very first thing he said to me, right? He hit a he hit one of those bowls, like one of those little meditation bowls, mm. and I was like, he'll be super vague. Don't be afraid of any form of dementia in old age. You will never have it. Oh, Boom. wow. Straight but, I mean, off. he said that you'll never have it. Yeah. I know. So but that's don't be afraid of dementia because you won't get it, yeah. is what he's saying. I know. And I was like, it's oh. to know. Well, that's it. Honestly, th that was the very first thing he said. And I was like... And a bit like you, it, I suddenly realised that I was quite afraid of having dementia and I hadn't really thought about it. Can I? And you'll remember him saying that you won't get it. I mean, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the thing. This, 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 this to me, I, I hate to be the one to point this out. Sure. But if, if he's wrong, you won't be able to understand that he was wrong. Hmm. No, but. Because um, you'll get dementia. Sure. And then who, who, you're, what, you're going to complain? You're not going to be able to. You but I'll have flashes of lucidity, <laughs> and in those moments, I'll go I'll write a complaint, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> because that's the thing that it, like occurred to me too about you going to his apartment. Apart, like unless he's just moving from place to place, he's made himself very accountable. Mm. Like you know where he lives, you yeah. know his name. Whereas my lady, who knows she's yeah. back there? Yeah. She's just a substitute. Exactly. You go back in there, and it's like a fishing shop, and yeah. you're like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> I swear, last week this was a psychic. So did he make any other predictions? He would. He monologued at me for an hour and fifteen minutes, what? making Whoa. nonstop prediction, boom prediction, boom prediction, Damn. boom prediction about everything. And you were pleased with everything. He was honestly. He's a pretty big fan of the life of this guy. Oh I, my gosh, <laughs> that's great news for you. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. <laughs> I'm stoked for you. Yeah. Some of them were weird for sure. Like he he did went through a lot of work stuff. Um, relationship stuff. He said very nice things about my partner Alex. Yeah. He was like, "I see a blonde woman in your life," and I'm like, oh, "Yeah, that's my oh. Oh, that's my girlfriend Alex." Okay, yeah, yeah. You think too vague? Yeah, too vague. But also, he's like, "Yeah, he pinned you down to be a blonde woman guy." <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know what? I feel pretty good about it because I feel like people who are normally blonde women guys don't look like this. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's true. I think I'm breaking the stereotype. Yeah, all right. Uh, Actually, but <laughs> that's what Hum said. When I, when, I, when I was telling her about the psychic, yeah. um, I said, oh, she thinks you work too much. She's like, she's just seen that you're Chinese. And she thinks you've married another Chinese person and that's the problem. I'm like, oh, my goodness, it's racial profiling. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a couple of weird things he said. He predicted we'd have three kids, oh one girl, gosh. two boys. 
Interesting. Pray now, our, our, our other children on the on the, the <laughs> yeah. last thing we're thinking of is another child. Well, you got to plan early, you know. Mm. Um, and but then he oh, he gosh, was. Legit. You actually don't look like you've gotten over that. No, I haven't. <laughs> no. I'm like, I don't want three kids. No. And our thing is, Alex. Once I told Alex, I think I could see her think a bit like. Yeah, three kids sounds nice. So I was like, oh, fuck you, oh, this Dennis. This is the way you had the conversation. <laughs> yeah. And Alex is called Dennis. Like, <laughs> it's, she's just been feeding him what she wants to hear. But he he predicted that our sons would be circumcised. Oh. And he was like, I don't know why. It won't you be religious Jewish. reasons. Oh. That is wild. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to predict right? the dick status of your <laughs> unborn sons <He> was, <laughs> is a crazy thing to do. That is wildly inappropriate. Why? He's a psychic. <laughs> Yeah, but like, just like, even if you have that thought, shut the fuck up! Don't say that. Don't like. No, but Dennis doesn't, doesn't have a filter. Dennis, Dennis has. Dennis said right from the start. He's like, he said, I have no filter. He actually said, I'm a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'm a. I can be a real bitch. And I was like, fuck yeah, Dennis, I love you. That's that's can that's. You... What, but this is what I mean. This is why I warmed to Dennis, and I really warmed to Dennis. I have to say this. I I like him. Like whether or not it's true told, or not, he told, time will tell. And he told you everything, foreskins and all. Well, because <laughs> without giving too much away, I'm not circumcised. It's completely breaking tradition. Like, and he couldn't know that. I was wearing underwear for a change. Oh wow! But he Crazy. he referenced dick dicks a couple of times, and he used the word dick, which was always because when he was talking about my um my mental health, he was going. You, he talked about, he was like, uh, when he said, I'm not going to get dementia, he's like, you're going to live a long life. He said, the only thing I see is some stomach problems. Um, he said, sometimes when you get uh, nervous before a presentation or something. And I was like, I 100% do that. Like when I get very bad anxiety, I just vomit, uh, which is very embarrassing. Interesting. Um, but he was like, it will never go down to your dick. <laughs> Whoa! Like, he's so thanks, dick Dennis. focused. Yeah, yeah. He, he is dick focused. Also, it doesn't take a psychic to know that you're not going to vomit out your dick. Like that's not how. <laughs> That's not, that's not what aren't. you call it, or <laughs> but what, do you, what does that mean? Am I silly? Mean? Like, what did it Is mean that he wouldn't go down? To, it wouldn't go down to your dick. No he, impotence. Is that no what impotence. Oh, yeah, huh. you, you like a flaccid fellow on account of anxiety. Oh, well, okay. yeah. Hmm. He just said whatever it was in my stomach wouldn't go down to my dick. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's so great news, I guess. Thanks, Dennis. I said to Alex because Alex is a you know she's a doctor. Hmm. She's an obstetrician. She works in you know delivering babies. Yeah, I was like. Here's a crazy thing Dennis said. He said we'd have two sons and that they'd be circumcised, but not for religious reasons, like maybe a health thing. I'm like, that doesn't happen, right? She's like, no, that can definitely happen. Like sometimes um, baby boys can be born and with like, and basically their foreskin's like too tight. Oh. And they have oh, to, yeah. you have to get a circumcision sure. for like health reasons. Mm. And, I, and she's like, no, it happens like not frequently, but not never. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> well, Get ready. <laughs> the moment we have our son. With a tight dick. She's going yeah. to have a tight as hell dick. <laughs> well, I mean, now that he said it, I can see you with a girl and two boys. What do you, well, of course, ne- what, why, what do you mean? Well, I imagine it now. Now that he's, yeah, I like can see the, you with two little, like, surfy grommet boys. Oh, that's you nice. with a, as a dad on the beach. Do you I know, can see that. He actually made a prediction about the last, the, the end of my life. He said, in the, in the last 20 years of your life, he said, you'll move somewhere very boring, like Newcastle or the Central Coast. He goes, somewhere terrible, but it will be heaven to you. <laughs> oh, wow. See, wasn't it funny that they both said things about being boring? I wonder yeah. if psychics mm. just think lay people are boring. And yeah. so that, like, makes its way into... Well, every, I mean, if you're a psychic and you can tell the future, everyone must be thrillingly of boring they to you. Would. Yeah. Yeah. Like, everyone who does not have access to the astral plane <laughs> must be... <laughs> and imagine being a psychic and having to simple. talk to, like, yeah. us at a party or something. Yeah. You're like, shut up. I can talk to God. Like, yeah. mm. <laughs> well, I also asked him about the success of this podcast because uh-huh. uh-huh. I felt like we had to know, right? Sure. Slightly different take, I'm okay. afraid. Oh, Battle of the Psychics. Yeah, <laughs> so this is what Dennis had to say about uh, the podcast. I hope this work is going to be successful. Mm. Even if not, according to my cup for you, Yeah. imagine it's a test and trial, which is okay but not great. Uh-huh. It's like one of those series. Oh, they only shoot the first season, then it stops. Sure. But it was it's memorable. Oh, 
Yeah. That's yeah. brutal. One season. One and done. I yeah. mean, maybe Hing gets an offshoot podcast from this and leaves you behind. I'm glad you brought that up. Someone's getting an offshoot podcast and it's not Hing. It is opening another door in the same institution. Uh-huh. One of the big heads is going to lo- like your the way you do your things, uh-huh. and the way you present and your ideas. Uh-huh. Another idea is going to take off, not this one. So, oh, okay. Ooh. Yeah. Damn. Sorry, Hing. Sorry, everyone. Actually, speaking of mm. um, sort of seasons of things and if things will go on. Oh, yeah. I'd forgotten about my new job during my reading. Oh, yeah. So I got at the start of the year, I got a new job at the project, which mm. is a, a show on Channel 10. Brag. And I, well, no, it's relevant because I, well, hang on, it's, hold on to that. No. <laughs> it might start off nice, but it goes downhill pretty quick. Because I said to her, we, we had like five minutes at the end. She was like, is there anything else you want to ask me about? And I said, oh, actually, yeah, I got a new job at the start of the year. I'm, how's that going to go? And she goes, I can see you doing it until the end of the year. But then it is unclear. I don't know what's happening after that. And I was like, what do you mean? I've got a, I, I, I thought I had a multi-year contract. Am I? And she's like, ah, this show, this new job, it, it might not be working. Anyway, so she's obviously been reading the Daily Mail, so a couple of, <laughs> couple of things about the ratings of this project. Uh, oh, my gosh. You know, your marriage? Marriage, your, yep. Um, yeah, obviously cold day, yeah, the, end of the contract. The only thing the that she was positive about <laughs> was the podcast, Okay. So Hold I'm going to tell you, it, if this doesn't work, <laughs> the rest of my life is <laughs> fucked. <okay? laughs> I um, obviously I can I cannot speak to the accuracy of Dennis. I don't know yet, uh-huh. but I I did leave a bit like you. I left being like, there was something about just going like, I'm not going to get dementia, and I'm not, and I'm going to live a long life, and I'm going to like be with my partner, and I'm going to have kids, and I'm going to keep working. There was something that like zoomed me out a bit from the just like constant internal little turmoil that I constantly live with hmm. that made me sort of go, oh, it gave me a little sigh of a breath where I got like, I reckon I got about 24 hours of relaxation that's, from Dennis. That's not nothing. But then oh. <laughs> then it all, then the doubt started to creep in and then I started to worry about if he'd been like implanting things, like if some of the things he'd said I was like, well, what if that only happens because I've gone or like he's trying to like, I got do into like, like a future paradox, a uh, neuro linguistic programming or something. That's right. He's trying to say some keywords to you. Yeah. And then like, you know, three years later, you're trying to chop kill the president. Dick in- <laughs> oh, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're trying to moil, you DIY moil situation. Yeah. Can I be honest? Yeah. These doubts, I think that's mostly on you. I don't yeah. think that's on Dennis. That's yeah. what I mean. I, I feel agree. Like, yeah. Dennis I feel is like, wonderful. We all agree that. Yeah. On that I feel point, like, yeah. I feel like you're. Pre-existing anxiety, yeah, that he managed to, um, you know, alleviate for uh, for a period, I think has has just sort of risen back up to normal. Yeah, and I yeah. think actually you might need to go and see Dennis <laughs> every day. <laughs> <laughs> so as we all reflect on our, um, I guess, journeys to the astral plane with various mm. psychics, Ron, for you, was the psychic a silver bullet? Ah, uh, yeah, it was. Uh-huh. I'm cured. <laughs> Outsourced. Would you genuinely say like it helped? It has helped you long term. Um, like th- obviously not. We're not saying psychics are the same as a mental health professional, but for you specifically, do you think that helped? I think it really helped in me just having someone tell me everything was going to be okay. Yeah, oh, as a reassurance technique. Now, did you not yeah. have any friends or family who would do that? Or <laughs> yeah, but they can't talk to the, the future. Yeah, and How I think having an outside voice telling you, and also someone with a calming presence. She's coming in neutral mm. and says, "Right, I don't know you from a bar of soap. Yeah, I I'm think a things stranger. Be okay. Yeah, I'm a stranger. I'm looking at you. Some really good stuffs." On the way for you. Okay. What Wink. about for you, Lewis? Honestly, I think I the fact that he managed to shake my anxiety for, even for 24 hours mm. means that I have to give it, it might not be a silver bullet, but it's kind of like a bronze bullet. A bronze bullet? Mm. Like it's a temporary, it was a temporary solution. And if someone said, should I go to see Dennis? I would, I would, I mean, I wouldn't recommend it to everyone. I think you need to be able to take a psychic a little bit with a grain of salt. But for me... Hell yeah. I might go back. <laughs> For me, I would say tin. A tin bullet. <laughs> ba- barely functioning. A soft, malleable metal. Useless in most armed situations. Tin bullet for me. But I will say that given how the three of us have rated the psychic, it does feel that our ratings reflect our attitudes going in. Mm. And maybe a psychic's the kind of thing where you get out of it what you put in, you know? 
I went in paranoid, frustrated, and I came out mm. paranoid and frustrated. Ron, you went in thinking it could solve your problems, and it did. And Lewis, you were kind of confused by the whole thing and remain. Yeah, I just want to be friends with Dennis. <laughs> Did Dennis predict that would happen? No, he didn't. He said he doesn't. He actually made the point a few times saying that he doesn't really uh, leave the house much and he doesn't really like having friends too much. Huh. He said he's just a, an isolated homebody. He said, I think he, he mentioned that he would love to just be like a monk who lives on the hill alone and just think about the future. You're attracted to that, though. He's a rare Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> well, Veronica, thank you so much for coming in. I um, can't believe that I actually didn't know this about you. I actually feel... Um, there are some things you don't know about me, Lewis. I don't know. Not, not many. No, not many. That's a, and that feels like a big one. That's a real core memory of yours. Yeah. Well, especially since like I, I was unsure about my relationship and then it ended up all working out. Yeah. <laughs> Go on, Al. Huh? For now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can okay. I also just say yeah. um, you knew that there was a solution to anxiety. And you haven't bothered to mention it. No, for the, you I was it like, for a I've known you since I was fourteen, and you're just mentioning it now. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I'm kind of enjoying watching him suffer like this, decade after decade. It's really sick. Yeah, uh, sorry. Thank you so much for listening to Hobber and Hing's Silver Bullet. If you've enjoyed it, why not recommend it to a friend, you know? In fact, if you're with a friend right now, just grab their phone and go to the, their podcast app and then type in Hobber and Hing's Silver Bullet. I'll wait. And then uh, once you've done that, just hit that uh, follow button. In this, I don't want to get bogged down in this for too long, but in this situation, mm -hmm. you imagine that there are two friends together. Yeah. And one of them is listening to our podcast. Or, yeah, yeah, what, maybe they're driving. Maybe, your... they're, maybe, here's what it is. is this... Here's the situation. You're going on a long road trip. You're this is your silver bullet. And you've been telling them, oh, they, 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 you'll In enjoy your this. headphones or no, on, no, on no, the no. phone? It, it, on, I mean, on loud. the car. It's a long road trip. Oh, okay. And the person who's driving is like, I do love this. I wish I could subscribe. I wish I could follow this podcast because I'd like to listen to more. Well, then right now, pick okay. up their phone and hit that follow button. Who's driving? The person who likes the podcast but ah. has been able to follow. That's because they're two hands on the wheel, 10 and 2. Oh, sure, Safety sure, sure. first. Okay, that's good. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'll, that's the end I of the will podcast. accept this hypothetical situation now because for a while there, it sounded like you thought the way mm. to have a friendship is to sit next to someone mm -hmm. and put in headphones and listen to podcasts. Oh, also we're on YouTube. <laughs> we are also <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> Have you ever stood in front of an overflowing wardrobe and thought, I've got nothing to wear? Well, that is exactly what the fashion industry wants you to think. The average Australian buys 56 pieces of clothing and chucks out 15 kilos of clothes every year. It feels like we're on a fast fashion treadmill that's kind of hard to get off. So how did we get here? I'm Veronica Milsom, host of Threads, the podcast that undresses the fast fashion industry. From the marketing tricks that are being used on us right now to the lies. Threads. It's everything. Hello, fast I'm Claire Nichols. This is the book Here, show. Right now and I've the gone ABC back now. into the archives to bring you today's wonderful conversation with the utterly charming Julian Barnes. He is a Booker winner. He won the prize in 2011 for The Sense of an Ending. He's also a deep thinker and a fabulous storyteller, as you're about to hear. Julian and I spoke via video call at last year's Sydney Writers' Festival. Hello. Hello. Your new book is called Elizabeth Finch. It's about an incredible teacher. And you, Julian Barnes, were raised by teachers. Can you tell me a bit about your mum and dad? Um, yes, I come, I come from several generations of teachers. My, my great-grandfather was a village headmaster, um, my maternal grandparents were both teachers. My parents were both teachers. Um, my, my brother is an ancient philosopher, um, ancient in both senses of the word. <laughs> um, and so I, 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 I did grow up in a house where my parents would, you know, do the marking and, and put the red crosses and ticks uh, on the essays and so on. Um, but... I'd say two things. One was that they weren't, they, they were, uh, this is, I was growing up, I was born in 1946, I was growing up in the 50s, really. Um, they were liberal for their time. They expected you to work hard uh, and study hard, but uh, they were never um, oppressive or brutal in their expectations. And so I didn't feel, I, you know, it's, it's like, 
that you, you just assume that your parents are normality. You know, however abnormal they might subsequently turn out to be, they will seem to the person involved, the child, to be normal. Um, I think the only effect it's had on me uh, as a person, uh, and especially as a writer, is that it's made the, me the opposite of a school teacher. I'm not a didactic writer. I don't try and tell you how to live or what's right and what's wrong. I, t I try to tell stories which set out various um, problems, hypotheses, um, moral questions, and and I'm not saying this is this is this is right, this is wrong, this is how you should behave. I'm saying, what do you think about it? I mean, I don't see when I think of the me, the writer, and you, the reader. I don't think I'm on some sort of high dais or on a throne. I think we're. My image of it is always that we're sitting side by side outside, say, a cafe, and we're looking across to the other side of the road, and, um, and we're looking at the people who go past, and I'm sort of saying to you, what do you think those two are up to? Hmm, um, do you think they're married? Hmm, that, mm, what's going on there? And, 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 and sort of heart, listening to your response at the same time as I'm making these suggestions about what we're both looking at. I, I am interested in what it was like to grow up in the Barnes household. You know, you've got these teacher parents, and of course you became a novelist and your brother became a philosopher. Was it a household where big ideas were discussed at the kitchen table? Not at all. No, it's have you, have you, have you got your lunch? <laughs> have you done your homework? Um, have you changed your underpants? Things like that. I mean, we didn't, it was, it was not, um, it was not, it wasn't a place where ideas were discussed. I mean, the thing about Englishness is a lot of it is transmitted and beliefs and uh, are, are sort of assumed rather than uh, discussed. I mean, you know, the, classic three things that weren't discussed in my childhood were uh, religion, sex, and politics. Um, I didn't know how my parents voted till I was in my 20s, probably. And we, we certainly didn't discuss politics apart from, you know, listening to the radio and my, uh, my mother had every so often saying stupid fool when <laughs> someone on the left was talking. <laughs> um, so uh, it was also, you know, it was an, I, I'm one of the last sort of generation of children who didn't have television until they were about 10 or 11. And then it came in and then it was, it was, a, it was a, we bought it second hand. It was enormous. It looked like a wardrobe and it had double doors which closed and opened. And so there was always a ceremony of when we actually watched it. And we watched very little of it, I realize now, compared to people with their, their tablets and iPhones and so on. So... Yes, books were, books were at home. there were lots of books at home, and books were respected, but um, it wasn't as if there was an expectation that you might write a book yourself. I mean, that's the thing about writing. Um, I mean, Martin Avis once said, it's not as if you were a butcher because your dad was a butcher. Though, of course, in his case, he was a writer because his father was a writer, <laughs> but that's very rare. Normally, you, you become a writer by not being the child of a writer, by finding your excitement in books, by finding the fact that they describe life uh, accurately in ways that other authorities, including your parents, don't describe life. Um, so it's a process, well, it was a process for me, about, of, of thinking or, first of all, thinking that reading was the great, contained the great explanations of life. Um, and then thinking that, trying to imagine that I could do it myself. I mean, I, my first book came out when I was 34, which in itself shows that I had, um, well, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily show this, but it, it, it was the case that I had a great lack of confidence. You know, you spend your time at school and university reading the, all the world's great classics, and then you come along and you think, well, I'm writing a novel. And and the voice in the back of the head says, "Oh yeah, you and who else? I mean, who's <laughs> you've just been reading 
Shakespeare, Flaubert, Nathaniel Hawthorne, etc., etc. What what makes you think you can add to the pile of literary knowledge and literary application that's gone on for centuries before you? So you have to you have to get round that question first of all. Um, but uh, I, I I look back on my childhood as as being safe as much as anything else. I mean. Uh, I, I, I have both um, both positive and sort of negative feelings about it. I mean, the ne- by negative, I mean they didn't do me any harm. <laughs> Did, you Did you need some harm? Did you need some harm? Did I need some harm? Well, I was thinking of sort of, you know, psychological harm rather than, no, they never beat me. No, 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 no. I was beaten at school, but I wasn't ever beaten by my parents. What did your parents make of you becoming a novelist? Well, I was I was sort of lots of things before I became a novelist. Um, they, uh, I gave my first novel when I was 34, as I said, um, and there was a sort of stunning silence for several weeks. And um, then uh, I was going down for lunch. They lived about... Um, 50 miles outside London. And, and I thought, oh, God, what's going to happen now? And um, eventually the subject was brought up. Uh, and I think it was brought up in this way. My mother suggested that I drive my father to uh, do some shopping. And this is so English. He was able to talk to me about my novel while I had my eyes on the road so that we didn't have to, we couldn't make eye contact. We couldn't face one another directly. Um, and he, he said something like, um, uh, we thought it was a good first effort. Um, mind you, um, the language was a bit lower deck. Um, a, phrase, a phrase from his time in the armed forces in the Second World War. Um, and I thought that was, that was as good as you could expect, you know. Um, and then I published one more novel and two pseudonymous thrillers, which I advised them not to read. Uh, so naturally, uh, they, they, they thought they had a look at them, <laughs> and, uh, but didn't like them. And then I published Flavius Parrot. And um, I was, it came out in something like September or October. And, and the next month, it was shortlisted for the Booker Prize. And I think that was the moment when, and my photograph with the other shortlisted candidates was on the front page of the Times, the London Times. And I think that was the moment where my parents thought, oh, yes, well, you know, he may write some mucky stuff, but he seems to be accepted. <laughs> <laughs> so all you've got to do is be shortlisted uh, for the booker and then mum and dad will be <laughs> proud of you. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a tip I pass on to any future <laughs> writers in the audience. I'm noting that down. Uh, your book, as I said, Elizabeth Finch, about this life-changing teacher... What, for you, Julian, makes for an incredible teacher? Oh, I'm not, I'm not sure I ever had one. I mean, there are some writers, like my, my old friend Ian McEwan, who was absolutely um, reorientated uh, t- towards the interests which then led him to become a novelist by a teacher, uh, who, an English teacher, who sort of sorted him out and made him concentrate and... And, and he stayed in touch with him um, all through his life. And the, the, he, the guy died, uh, I think he was about 100, wow. only, only quite recently. And in fact, I've just been reading the proof of, of Ian's new novel called Lessons. And he puts the, he puts the teacher into the novel. Um, and apparently the teacher insisted on, on using his own name, using his proper name, which is a lovely tribute. And then it says at the back, alas, he died, but, uh, you know, he insisted on, on using his own name. Um, I had teachers of, you know, uh, across the, the spectrum, you know, uh, te- teachers are very various. Um, I mean, I taught myself in a Catholic school for a year in France, mm. and, I, and I saw a great disparity of human behavior, even amongst the priests. Uh, I had lazy teachers. I had pig ignorant teachers. I had clever teachers, I had funny teachers, I had frightening teachers, you know, it's the, the usual array. Um, I had an English master when I was 15, it was in the, what was the first year sixth form, 
And he was, uh, he was very uh, remarkable. He'd just come down from Cambridge, so we had him fresh, you know. He hadn't got disillusioned by teaching. Um, and he would do, he would do things like um, talk about Kurt Douglas's performance in Spartacus, which had just come out. And we thought, wow, I didn't know teachers were allowed to talk about the movies. Um, and then he, he would do things like when he was teaching us T.S. Eliot, he'd go to the blackboard and he'd write, birth and copulation and death. And then he turned around and said, those are the three things that life consists of, um, which of course depressed us all um, <laughs> amazingly. It didn't even sound, copulation didn't even sound much fun. You know, it's a horrible <laughs> word, isn't it? Um, and then you get death, you get, you know, you're born, you get a bit of copulation, then you die. Uh, a bleak vision Mr. Elliot had, as far as we could understand <laughs> anyway. Um, but he did, I think the fact that he, he, he didn't just have a textbook in front of us and we worked through it and he, he sort of made, a, made contact with, <coughs> with, with real life, the words on the page related to um, and should inform our understanding of uh, the, the life that we were living. Um, but, he, you know, even so, I didn't, I didn't go to university to read English. I, it wasn't that sort of... He didn't have that sort of impression on me. I went and read modern languages. But, you know, you're lucky if you get one. Yeah. Well, let's talk about Elizabeth Finch. Who is she? Mm. Who is she? Well, when we meet her, uh, it's sort of the 1980s in London, and she is probably in her early 50s. She teaches uh, an evening class in culture and civilization at some offshoot of what we presumed to be London University. And she has uh, a particular manner of teaching, which is, um, it's not, again, it's not didactic. It's, it's sort of provocative. Um, she doesn't say things like, Goethe said that, and then, then everyone thinks, oh God, Goethe said that, that must be right. Um, she says things like a very famous writer uh, who was dying in his 82nd year, remarked that he had only uh, experienced one quarter of an hour of happiness in his entire life. Um, and, that, uh, and so the notion is, you're, that's the given. That's the, that's the information you're given. And you don't think who, who was saying it. So you don't have to think, oh, Goethe, I don't remember who he was. Did he, oh, did he write, did he write play? Was he, was he a poet? Can't remember. You know, you, you get the nugget of, that she wants you to discuss. She, she has a very, she doesn't lecture from notes. She's, it's all in her head. Um, but lecture isn't quite the right word because it's more conversational. And yet her conversation is very precise. She, um, she talks as she writes. That's to say, you, f you hear the punctuation. And there are some people who are like that. They're rare, but um, they do exist. Maybe now's the time to read a little bit from the book, Julian, because as you say, she does have this very distinct, clear way of talking. Yes. So yes. Let's, let's, pick, yeah. let's go to page this six of the book where Neil's remembering what Elizabeth was like in the lecture theatre. In my mind's eye, my memory's eye, the only place I can see her, she is standing before us, preternaturally still. She had none of those lecturers' ticks and tricks designed to charm, distract, or indicate character. She never waved her arms about or supported her chin in her hand. She might occasionally put a slide up to illustrate a point, but that was mostly unnecessary. She commanded attention by her stillness and her voice. It was a calm, clear voice, enriched by decades of smoking. She wasn't one of those teachers who only engaged with their students when they looked up from their notes, because, as I said, she didn't lecture from notes. It was all in her head, fully thought out, fully processed. This also compelled attention, reducing the gap between her and us. Her diction was formal, her sentence structure entirely grammatical. Indeed, you could almost hear the commas, semicolons, and full stops. She never started a sentence without knowing how and when it would end. Yet she never sounded like a talking book. 
Her vocabulary was drawn from the same word box she used for both writing and general conversation. And yet the effect wasn't archaic in any way. It was intensely alive. Julian Barnes reading from his latest novel, Elizabeth Finch. Julian was my guest via video from the UK at the Sydney Writers' Festival. And Elizabeth Finch is a singular literary creation, clever and caring, but guarded and cool. She has a startling impact on her adult student, our narrator, a guy called Neil, as Julian explains. She's a woman who is sort of out of her time, but not old-fashioned. It's a mistake to think that she's old-fashioned. As he says, at one point, Neil, who is sort of half in love with her, if not more, um, he says, you know, there was something about her that resembled, you know, an aged goddess. Yes, I know what I'm saying, he goes on. Um, and there's something about her which is, uh, well, it ta- she, she, always, she takes the longer view, and it's often sometimes a very long view. She teaches them about, for example, early Christianity, um, the end of the Roman Empire, or the end of Christianity in the Roman Empire, the end of paganism, uh, representations of religion, famous pictures. And she, she, is, she never imposes anything on them. And she says, and this is a, a, a line which I, I remember thinking myself when I was taught for a, 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 sem- a semester in America, in Baltimore, at Hopkins University, I realized very early on that I wouldn't be, I was teaching creative writing and there were about 10 students. They're all very intelligent. They're all very different. And I very quickly realized that I wouldn't be the best teacher for all of them. That for some, I would be, I would be a person who could see exactly what they wanted to do, who could help them, who could give them, you know, show them shortcuts and things like that. And then there was some, like, there was a very charming boy who didn't, wrote nothing but Gen X stories. And somehow I was the wrong target audience for that. Um, and then there was another boy who, who when anyone criticised any of his work uh, in the class, he put his fingers together and, like a gun and pointed them at the, at the critic, um, which was a bit unnerving. Um, <laughs> though it would be even more unnerving now, I think, because you think he probably does have a gun in his back pocket. Um, no, uh, I, so I, enjoy, I, I enjoyed the stints of teaching. I, I did that also in France, in Brittany, and in, a, in, a, in a, an entire abbey full of, full, of, full of priests. That was great fun. They were very nice to me as well, <laughs> on the whole, yes. They didn't, um, well, the thing, there were two trouble. This was in 1965, six, and um, I mean, the, the British and the French have a, rather traditional views of one another. And occasionally I would, there was a very old canon who was sort of, um, had, had a funny octagonal hat, and he was, he was very benign, but every time I passed him on the stairs, he would say, ah, la perfide Albion, perfidious Albion, um, which is their phrase for us. Um, and then there was, there was one priest who was very worried that I'd, I, that I'd never been baptized or christened or uh, brought into the church. Um, and he was very worried about the state of my soul. And I said, well, you know, I'm only 21. Maybe I'll worry about that a bit later, which he thought was frivolous, uh, as indeed it was. And then <laughs> some, some months later, he sat next to me very confidentially. And he said, you know, to tell you the truth, I wouldn't have got into all this, meaning the priesthood. Uh, if I didn't think there was heaven at the end. And I thought, oh, what an, what an amazingly practical view of religion. <laughs> <laughs> I want to come back to um, Elizabeth Finch and where she comes from, because I understand this was partly inspired by a friend of yours, the novelist and fellow Booker winner, Anita Bruckner. Can you tell me a little bit about your friendship with Anita? Yes, I first met Anita Bruckner when she defeated me for the Booker Prize in 1984, which she won with a Hotel du Lac. And, and I naturally thought I should have won it, but then everyone else always thinks that. Um, and uh, despite that, we, we got on terribly well. She was very, uh, relati- I, I suppose I saw her one, maybe twice a year, in, but they're in very 
sort of controlled circumstances, which I borrowed for Elizabeth Finch. There were a couple of things I borrowed from Anita. Um, and she would, we, we would have lunch, and she would always pay. And um, she would always be there when I arrived. Uh, however early I arrived, she was always there, the cigarette on. And the lunches would usually last an hour and a quarter and no longer, and then she would call for the bill. Uh, so she was, uh, she, was, she was in some ways controlling, but she was great fun. She was a very witty woman, uh, as well as a highly intelligent novelist. And when I was thinking about this novel, she was sort of there in the beginning as a kind of moral template. I thought I want someone, I want a, a woman of, of, of high seriousness, of European intelligence, who is quite different and yet inspiring. And I, there's, one, there's, there's just one incident which I um, put straight into the book because I couldn't resist it, which is we're having, we're having lunch one day and we're having different things. And she sort of reached her hand across the table, halfway across the table, and she peered at my plate and she said, how is that? Disappointing? <laughs> With great sort of glee, you know. She was hoping that, it, that my food was filthy. It was very funny and very typical of her. Uh, and, I, and I put that in. But um, Elizabeth Finch is, has quite different interests from Anita Bruckner. And, and um, I suppose you could, I could put it this way. I once, saw, I once saw a famous actor interviewed on television. <clears throat> and they, was, they asked the usual question, you know, how, how do you build the character? And he replied, I always start with the shoes. Once I've got the shoes right, then I can start building the character. I thought that was quite interesting. Um, and, and, and I suppose I used Anita Bruckner's shoes and I put Elizabeth Finch into them. And then she walked off in a different direction. <laughs> um, I mean, it isn't, you know, the book isn't about Anita Bruckner, um, let alone a Roman a Clay or anything like that. Um, I sent it to my old friend, uh, the Australian writer Murray Bale, who knew Anita very well. He knew it probably as well as I did. I mean, better than me, probably. And, um, and he sent me a few notes back and said, yes, just a faint whiff of Anita. <laughs> and I think that's, that's her presence in the book is a faint whiff. Okay. Our book starts out as this portrait of Elizabeth Finch and her impact on our narrator, Neil. Then on page 73, Julian, the book shifts. What, what happens? <laughs> well, we then come across a character called Julian the Apostate, um, who has been referred to by uh, Elizabeth Finch. Elizabeth Finch leads us towards him. And this is a non-fiction part of the book. I mean, in my previous novels from Shrewes Parrot, onwards, I've often used non-fiction as well as fiction uh, in this, you know, the, I don't make a huge distinction between them. I like to indicate what is fiction, what is non-fiction in the book, but uh, I go where the story is. I go where the interesting story lies, whether it's fiction or non-fiction. So I'm, uh, I'm a sort of, maybe a, I'm a literary outcast, to use Flaubert's <laughs> word again, um, in that respect. Um, Julian the Apostate uh, was the last pagan emperor of Rome. Um, Constantine introduced Christianity and for a few dozen years, a few score years, um, the Roman emperors were Christian. Um, Julian the Apostate was brought up a Christian, but always secretly believed in the old pagan gods, in the Hellenistic vision of the world. And when he came to the throne, in 362 AD, uh, he, he announced his paganism. He says, uh, I am not a Christian. Uh, on the other hand, I, I acknowledge that there are Christians and I acknowledge that they have a different God from me. So he was a, he was a tolerant emperor. Uh, he, he, didn't, he didn't promote Christianity, but he accepted it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, perhaps for the course of Western civilization, he was only emperor for 18 months, and he was um, he was killed in the Persian desert by a Persian uh, spear or lance. Um, 
you know, the rule is, rule in the ancient world is never invade Persia. Always a bad idea. Alexander the Great, he should have learned from that. <laughs> and modern equivalent is never go into Afghanistan. Um, I remember when uh, I was with an American friend, when the Americans were just about to invade, I said, don't do it. Whatever you do, don't go into Afghanistan. We, the British, went in three times. We had three wars in Afghanistan. We lost all of them. You've just seen the Soviets go in, and they got a bloody nose as well. Don't go into Afghanistan. No, no, we'll be able to sort it, he said. Mm. Aha. <laughs> um, not that we think Afghanistan has turned out well in the end either. Um, but still, so he was, um, he was, he was, this is the story. This is the story. He was, he was, as he lay dying on the battlefield, he put his hand to his chest. He grabbed a handful of blood. He threw it into the air and he, he cried out, thou hast conquered, O pale Galilean. Now, the pale Galilean is Jesus Christ, and this remark is taken as uh, an admission not just of military defeat, but of theological defeat, and that from then on, uh, the Roman Empire and its succession, successors would be Christian. Um, and I, I came across it first in a poem by... The English poet Swinburne, 19th century, late 19th century, Swinburne, thou hast conquered, O pale Galilean. And I'd never been interested in Swinburne's poetry. And at first I didn't know what it related to because he didn't, there's nothing in the poem. The poem's called Hymn to Proserpine. Proserpine being the, the goddess, the protectress goddess of Rome, who was then replaced by, um, by Mary, the mother of God who is still the protectress of Rome. And Swinburne's attitude to this was that this was a terrible moment in Western civilization, um, that the ancient Hellenistic beliefs were that life was the, the only place where light and joy could be had. And that when we die, we went, we go to a, some sort of vaguely drifting place, but you know, with no specific um, story to it. Um, whereas then the Christians came along, and the Christians introduced guilt and shame and pain, and their view was that this the world was a terrible, terribly um, gloomy place, sad and sinister, and that the only um, the only joy and light and happiness to be had was after we died, presuming that we uh, behaved ourselves mm. and did as the priesthood told us. And, and so Swinburne think, thought, this, this is where it all went wrong. Mm. Um, and I think he does have a point. Well, let, let's, let's have a reading. Very, uh, let's have a reading to demonstrate yes. this. But just so people can kind of understand who haven't read the book, how does Elizabeth Finch and Julian the Apostate go together? The structure of the book is that we're with, we've got the Elizabeth Finch story. Uh, Neil decides he's going to write the essay he never wrote at, um, in this class. And then the middle section of the book is Neil's essay about Julian the Apostate. So we have a non-fiction section in the middle and then we go back to the Elizabeth Finch story in the third part of yes. the book. Yes, and then the Elizabeth Finch in the third section, Elizabeth Finch and... Um, during the past days, are sort of drawn closer together. Mm. Uh, in, and and a lot, there's a lot about how we remember the dead, but we might get onto that or we might not. Um, but uh, we've got a reading. Um, so this is from Neil's essay, and this is looking at this idea that we're talking about. What if, what if Julian had survived? How things might have been different? For his supporters down the centuries, Julian was that seductive thing, a lost leader. What if he had ruled for another 30 years, marginalising Christianity year by year, and gently, then forcibly, re-cementing the polytheism of Greece and Rome? And what if the policy was pursued by his successors down the centuries? What then? Perhaps no need for a renaissance, since the old greco roman ways would still be intact and the great scholarly libraries undestroyed. Perhaps no need for an enlightenment, because much of it would have already happened. The age-long moral and social distortions imposed by a vastly powerful state religion would have been avoided. By the time the age of reason came round, we would already have been living in it for 14 centuries. 
And those surviving Christian priests with their peculiar eccentric but harmless beliefs, or rather beliefs made harmless, would rub shoulders on equal terms with pagans and druids and spoonbenders and tree worshippers and Jews and Muslims and so on and so on, all under the benign and tolerant protection of whatever European Hellenism developed into. Imagine the last 15 centuries without religious wars, perhaps without religion, religious or even racial intolerance. Imagine science unhindered by religion. Delete all those missionaries forcing belief on indigenous people while accompanying soldiers stole their gold. Imagine the intellectual victory of what most Hellenists believed, that if there was any joy to be had in life, it was in this brief sublunary passage of ours, not in some absurd, disnified heaven after we're all dead. Yeah. Julian Barnes. Uh, I, it, it sounds wonderful, but uh, I, I suspect probably not <laughs> realistic. Well, that's what, that's what Neil says. I really love to discuss this with, with Elizabeth Finch, but alas, she's dead. And so he's, he's, he's speculating, as others have. I mean, one of the things about Julian the Apostate is though he was a short-lived emperor, um, he, his, his, his memory and what he stood for echoed down the centuries. I mean, for the first many centuries, he was, he was one of the uh, most loathed figures um, in Christianity, in the Christian Christian mythology, he was sort of up there with Pontius Pilate and and Herod, people like that. He was a famous bad guy, and it's interesting why he was a famous bad guy. It was because he didn't persecute the Christians enough. Um, there's one one Christian writer complained of what he called blander persecutio, which is say gentle persecution. He didn't kill them. He didn't give them the martyrdom that they desperately wanted. It was awful. He wasn't, he wasn't nasty to them. And therefore, you know, people might think that there was something in uh, this, this, the Greco-Roman um, uh, beliefs that he stood for. Um, and, he go, and then, cut a, a long story short, but it's all in the essay, then round about the 16th century, uh, Europeans, especially uh, French, uh, started to reread him and uh, and see the point of him, and he was in the 18th century. He was he was revered by Voltaire and by the British historian Edward Gibbon, and he was seen because he was seen as a symbol of tolerance. And then he goes on to the 19th century, and Ibsen writes an enormous, un unputonable play about him. Um, and you know, into the 20th century, Gore Vidal writes a novel about him. He's still there. Um, and I hope I make him last a bit longer. You're listening to The Book Show with me, Claire Nichols, and this episode was recorded in front of a live audience at the Sydney Writers' Festival with the British novelist, Booker winner and very deep thinker, Julian Barnes. As you can hear, Julian Barnes is really interested in religion and... That's surprising to me because, as you've already heard, Julian Barnes was raised without religion. He actually declared himself an atheist at 20 and an agnostic at 50. Where are you at now in your relationship with religion? Oh, I'm pretty antagonistic, I must say. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, say, I said I was an atheist at 20 because that's what you, that, that's when you're, you're most combative. And an agnostic at 50 because, you know, we don't know, we, we, we know quite a lot, um, but we don't know enough to know everything. And who knows? I mean, there are various theories about, uh, about it all. And it, one, of, one of my favourite ones, which was a, a, a sort of heresy, was that um, it, it's very difficult to understand the world and the religious explanation of it, given the, um, the suffering and the unfairness, the injustice, uh, and the, the, the pain and the terror that a lot of people experience as life. And the notion that there's some sort of God who caused it all, or who will explain it all to us after death, 
seems to me very far-fetched. Um, Bertrand Russell was once on a television program called Face to Face in England. This is back in the 50s. And um, it, was a, it was a television series that was famous because it was the first time the interviewer turned their back on the, ca on the camera. So you just saw the back of the interviewer's head and then you saw Bertrand Russell. And I think it's, I think it's still available on, on the BBC iPlayer, um, this interview. And there's a moment when the interviewer puts that question, which is, is often put to um, uh, famous atheists. Um, but Mr. Russell, what if you died and, and, you, and then you woke up? And when you woke up, you saw these sort of big gates made of pearl. And there was a man with a big key there. And he opened them. And then you went in. You went in and there, then uh, you saw this, uh, shall we say, man in a white uh, frock with a, with a big, big white beard. What would you do? And Bertrand Russell, who had a very strange, he was very sort of rather high-pitched, sort of aristocratic English voice. He replied, well, he said, I would say to him, but you didn't give us enough evidence. <laughs> which, which, which I think is the, is, the, is the perfect reply to God. I mean, when I was talking about um, other heresies, and there's one, one of the heresies was about... Deus abscondius, in other words, the absconding God. That's to say, uh, God created the world and he set it running, and then he realized he made a terrible posh of it, but it wasn't working. It was a complete cock up, and so he, he buggers off. So the absconding God. Um, and I think that 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 makes the it makes our understanding of the world and the relationship to a possible God. That makes great sense of it. I'm interested to know why someone who was an atheist at 20, agnostic in 50, at 50 and 60, spends so much time thinking and writing about religion. Well, I write a lot about other things, but I write a lot about death and I write a lot about love. And, um, you know, I, for, for, for almost the entire history of um, of the existence of men and women on this planet, they have had a religion of some sort, you know. And you can imagine that it did make sense when you were uh, alone um, on a, on a, on a, on a, in a desert with a few, few wild animals to, to catch and eat. And then the sort of the weather must, I mean, we take the weather for granted. The weather must have been so extraordinary. And it was just as the Romans and Greeks so much more rational, believe very much in um, symbols, in, in signs from heaven, and they would interpret them through you know, diviners. Um, so the, uh, you know, our ancestors out there with the dressing, whatever they were dressed in, if not anything, um, would, would, would feel, you know, what on earth is happening? Where have an, our ancestors gone to? Why are there these, all, all this stuff happening in the heavens? And they would come up with an explanation that there was someone who um, invented it and therefore was incredibly powerful and therefore should be um, revered. This is a very short history of theology. <laughs> um, and um, I... So, so I, though I, I, I don't believe in God, and indeed I've never been to a regular church service in my life anywhere. Um, you know, I, like most agnostics, I do uh, christenings, marriages, and deaths. I, I, I you, you know, you have to, you have to be interested in what everyone else is interested in, and and so, so yes, religion comes into it, and I sort of, it's also you quite like tweaking its tail from time to time. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I was meant to be doing a, um, an event in Bath Abbey, most beautiful building. Uh, it's arranged by the local Bath bookshop. Um, and at the last minute, they say, oh, no, we've, we've heard about this book of his, and um, no, he, he can't come here and s spread his filthy gospel of, <laughs> of unworship um, in, our, in our beautiful abbey. So we had, we had to reconvene at the bookshop instead. <laughs> and I thought, 
I thought, this is great, actually. I said, how many tickets have we sold? And they said, well, only 100. I said, well, this is great. We don't have to be in a vast, empty abbey. And now we can pride ourselves at being chucked out. I, mean, <laughs> I thought, uh, my, very, my first novel, Metroland, in 1980, was banned in South Africa. Well, it would only, it would only have sold about 20 copies anyway. But I thought it was a great, great badge of, uh, you know, virtue. And now, towards the end of my career, I've been banned from Bath Abbey. Um, again, <laughs> on both occasions, little damage was done. Well, we're very happy to have you here at CarriageWorks. Um, in your memoir, a memoir used loosely, Nothing to be Frightened of, you said that you thought about death mm. every day. You wrote that book more than 15 mm. years ago. Is that still true, Julian? Yes, yes, it is still true. I do think about it every day. I mean, uh, for various prompts, you know, uh, I reached the age where a lot of my friends had, um, and when, uh, you know, I can't make a promise that I'll come to the Sydney Writers Festival in 10 years' time, nice as it would be, though, I might be a very doddery figure by then, and might not want to be anyway. Um, I, yes, I think, I think it's, it, it's, it's now slightly more, slightly less, I feel slightly less terror now, um, and I wouldn't say I'm accepting of it. I think it's a really bad idea, death, and I want to have nothing to do with it, apart from thinking about it all the time. Um, I, think, I think I fear it slightly less because, you know, by the time you get to my age, all sorts of bits of you start going wrong when you... you, you or popping down the hospital every other day and that sort of thing, and you think, well... Uh, it's sort of what, what I'm, what I'm, what is going to be destroyed now is a sort of semi-broken down organism anyway, which, which you know the brain and the heart still work, but you know uh, not the rest very well. Um, so it's I, it's also that thing of familiarising yourself with it. Um, Montaigne, the great French thinker said, you should make a daily companion of death. You should think about it whenever your horse shies or, or a tile falls off a roof, you know? Ah, oh, I could have been dead then when my, my horse just shied, or that, that roof tile could have hit me on the head. So you, have, you sort of, I mean, I can't promise that I'll be uh, aware of it uh, in the right way. I might walk out into the street outside and... Um, get run down by a delivery van. Um, anyway, um, I, no, I mustn't think like that. <laughs> <laughs> I must be positive about that. Is, is there a comfort in having this incredible body of work, you know, uh, this contribution you've made that will outlive you? Does writing make you immortal in a way? No, no. <laughs> writing makes a few people immortal for a few centuries. Um, but uh, the way the way that the the, the, the humanity is, is 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 destroying the planet, you know, there may not be any books and there may not be any electricity to power your Kindles and, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, I think uh, I think we're not also humanity is not very good at cooperating uh, enough at the right times when it's endangered. Um, so uh, I don't think. Uh, I, did, I, I like to think of, I like to think of people reading me after my death. Yes, and but then I realised, as I wrote about in Nothing to Be Frightened of, that you know maybe for another generation or a bit more, and then gradually my readership will drop off, and then there will be the last person who ever reads one of my books, and I, I thought about this person. Uh, and I thought I was beginning to feel sort of rather tender towards him or her, you know, my last reader, my last reader. <laughs> and then, and then I realised, by definition, your last reader is someone who doesn't recommend your books to anyone else. <laughs> Bastard. <laughs> Bastard. Uh Julian Barnes, you've been in the writing game for about four decades. Uh, does it get easier? In some ways, uh, because I, 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 I've done, I, you know, you know, 
you ha you ha sometimes the same problem comes up. It doesn't in the sense that um, my books are a rather different one from another, and I never know where I'm going next. Um, and so each book throws up new difficulties. Uh, but that's healthy, I think. You know, if you if you if you just knew what you were going to write exactly and didn't have any anxiety and panic in the course of it, it would just be like that game I had as a child called Painting by Numbers, where you had a sort of outline of of a of a picture and and uh, the paint box and the brushes, and you just filled in the colours according to the numbers in the little squares. I don't know if that still exists. Um, and so that would be uninteresting to me. I mean, I go, you, know, you can see, I think, behind me, my, my, I'm in my study, and the walls are yellow, bright yellow. Um, and that means that when I walk into my study every morning, I think I'm cheered by it. I think, oh, good, here I am again uh, on my own. And the sun's shining, even when the sun isn't shining because of my yellow wallpaper. Uh, and I sit down to work with great relish. And I think that's, that's just luck, you know, that's just, just how I am. Um, and there are, some, there are some writers who say I hate the process of writing. And I, to which I think, well, there are quite enough books already, so spare us. <laughs> <laughs> You were speaking earlier, you know, back at the start of your career about that, the voice in your head, you know, that slight imposter syndrome. How can I write a book when, you know, I've read Shakespeare? Yes. Is the voice yes. in the head still quite loud, even when you're a Booker winner and you're Julian Barnes? <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's quite a 